When you hear the word ambitious when it relates to video games, what do you think? Some of you may think back to the early to mid 2000s. One example from this time period could be Call of Duty 4 Modern Warfare. It was so ambitious with its modern day setting and addictive multiplayer that it went on to be considered a revolutionary title and not just the first person shooter genre, but gaming as a whole. A second example could be the early 2000s NASCAR games, specifically NASCAR Thunder 2002 through 2004. Just looking at the career mode alone, we went from just managing the car in Thunder 2002 to managing nearly every aspect of the team in Thunder 2004. The individual members of your crew, research and development for your car, more in-depth sponsorship management, all of that good stuff. Some of you may be thinking more along the lines of modern day. Star Wars Squadrons was ambitious because not only was it an EA published title that wasn't a garbage pay to win mess, but it was also a Star Wars arcade flight action game that had great gameplay. Managing your starfighters, shields and weapons, choosing between the different classes of starfighters, defending allied ships and engaging enemy ships, it was all there. Ace Combat 7 Skies Unknown is also ambitious for not only increasing the graphical quality a ton with the use of Unreal Engine 4, but I would argue that the big source of ambition and innovation is in its VR mode. Yeah, there may be only three missions in this mode, but seeing the fully detailed cockpits, watching as the enemy fighter jet you targeted bursts into pieces and flames when you shoot it down, and the general feeling of piloting a fighter jet in the Ace Combat universe, it is magical. Of course, ambition can be put in the wrong places, which is what makes ambition and innovation being put in the right places so special. One of the main instances in which ambition and innovation can be found is when a new video game franchise starts up. The first few entries can serve as the franchise finding its footing and honing in on what makes that franchise stand out from the crowd. Focusing back on the Ace Combat series, it began in 1995 with, well, Ace Combat. Also known as Air Combat outside of Japan, the name Ace Combat would be adopted worldwide for the series from Ace Combat 2 onward. Air Combat and Ace Combat 2 would prove to be the arcade flight action franchise establishing itself in the gaming market along with finding its footing. After the second entry, the team at Namco working on the series wanted the third entry to be the most ambitious and innovative entry yet. Air Combat was the series' first entry and thus plays more like a prototype when compared to the series today. Ace Combat 2 expanded upon Air Combat's gameplay and features introducing many staples of the series known today such as fictional aircraft, extra enemy aces per mission, and making the super weapon slash super fighter concept from the first game a mainstay. So far the series have been gradually innovating at a steady pace. The third entry in the series however is when the team went full throttle and applied the afterburner. They went so full throttle in fact that I would argue it's this game that really set the foundation for the future Ace Combat games to build upon. And beyond that, the game itself is jam-packed with tons of features, lore, and lots of things to take an in-depth look into. Which is why, instead of this being a review, this is instead a retrospective of Ace Combat 3 Electrosphere. It's no secret that video games are complex. From the sound design, graphics, gameplay, story, voice acting, and so much more, it can be a lot to handle. However, the pain of having to juggle and manage all of that can be eased a bit when not only does the game have a dedicated team with different people who specialize in those different areas, but it also helps when ambition is at an all-time high. One look at the development team's thoughts on the game, and it can be easily seen that this game was quite the ambitious one. 
Ace Combat 3 Electrosphere officially began development in 1998, with Hiroyuki Onoda leading the team for this endeavor as the project leader. Right from the start, the team knew they wanted the third entry in the Ace Combat series to be their biggest and best work yet. So much so, that they knew those who played the first two games would be surprised at how different this game would look and feel. Hiroyuki Onoda went as far as to say that he was hoping that players would be, quote, betrayed comfortably, instead of, it's the same game. He wanted to make sure that the changes and additions were significant enough to represent the leap forward for the series, but he didn't want to drive away those who had gotten settled in with the series having played the previous two games. How Onoda and the others on the team went about doing this was perfect. They kept the core arcade flight action gameplay and innovated the game around that. While I won't be able to go through every single thing the developers have said, I will touch on some of the key things that I think are really neat. And, of course, if you want to take a look at this full post-release development blog yourself, I'll leave a link to it in the description down below. The first thing I want to touch on is the camera. Being able to freely look around the aircraft as you fly is something that's second nature to not just Ace Combat players, but for the series as a whole. So, when reading up on how excited programmer Toshiyoki Koike was that this feature would be making its debut in Ace Combat 3, that gave me quite the shock. A free-moving camera isn't exactly what one would call a groundbreaking gameplay innovation most of the time, but I would honestly beg to differ. Aside from being able to look at the different angles of your fighter jet easier now, this mechanic also features gameplay benefits, such as being able to track your target by holding down the targeting button. Instead of needing to follow the arrow to your target, being able to track the target as you're getting into position can offer valuable intel, such as the enemy's movements. A simple addition on paper, but it's so much more than that in execution. Toshiyuki goes into more detail about this by saying, The concept introduced for the first time this time is line of sight operation. In 3D games, you often want to to know what's going on around you, right? The neck used to be fixed, but I had a desire to somehow release it from the time I was making Ace Combat 2. This time, I am very happy to be able to reflect that feeling in the product. I like it so much that I play around with my point of view every time, so I can't help but to miss my right thumb unless I play with DualShock. You really have to be careful about sickness from the viewpoint. Another thing I found neat was fitting the game into two discs, at least for the Japanese version of the game, which we'll get into both versions of Ace Combat 3 later in the video. Toshiyuki explains how originally the game came out to just under two and a half discs worth of storage when the goal was to fit it onto two discs. Some compression later and they were able to make their storage goal three weeks before the game was released. However, the data that can be held is 2.4 sheets, even if optimized and arranged, and it cannot fit in two sheets. By the time we have to do something about 0.4 more sheets, we have two months left until the deadline. I managed to get the data to be shaped up by a painter, and I managed to fit it into two discs by applying compression to compression and folding it into GU Kaku three weeks before the deadline. Programming for a video game requires that the programmer has some creative thinking and a lot of patience too. Focusing on the creative thinking aspect though, programmer Katsuhiro Ishii was in charge of the AI in the game, both for your allies and enemies. Katsuhiro tells of a unique way of testing the AI's performance in the game, by pitting the AI against each other multiple times to see how they behave and engage in combat on their own. This idea is genius to me, as it allows for the programmers to check the AI's effectiveness to allow them to have a helping hand in battle. Not so much help that it rips control away from the player or otherwise removes that main protagonist feel, but enough so that they're not just flying around there taking up space either. This kind of making is difficult and there are many difficult stories, but there are also many fun and interesting things. For example, checking the behavior of the aircraft. We checked the behavior of the aircraft this time by letting non-players perform survival battles with 30 aircraft and team battles of 5 to 5 with the prototype algorithm. After checking, make an actual mission, and it's time to sortie. When I started, Eric suddenly shot down Rena and Fiona on the first side. The targets escaped out of the area, Really the smartest action? The comrades defeat all the targets and clear the mission. Really, the aircraft in the middle of production do not hear what they say is. And again, the algorithm is reviewed and checked again. Nayoto Maeda was in charge of the mission design, how each of the games' missions would play out with the placement of enemies for the objective at hand. It's not something we think about too much. 
as long as the missions are designed well anyway, as we're focused on just playing the game and playing through the levels that have been designed. But for Ace Combat 3, this task was more of a difficult one given how big some of the missions are in this game. Of course, even the most large scale of missions in Ace Combat 3 pale in comparisons to games and their battle sizes today. But when compared to Air Combat and Ace Combat 2, and taking into account the PlayStation 1 hardware at the time, this was a pretty big thing to take into consideration. I was in charge of mission coordination for the general route. Mission coordination? I don't really understand what you mean. This is the part where fighters and ground weapons are actually placed on the map while considering the tempo and difficulty of the game. This time, the number of aircraft appearing during the mission has increased considerably compared to the previous work, and the work was enormous in proportion to it. This is also a result of the efforts of the program staff. Is it really completed? I feel like it is. Place and play, place and play, repeat every day. When I noticed it, the tip of the DualShock stick was worn and glowed black. Those are some of the key things that stood out to me when reading the developer essay about their processes of developing the game. I know I said this at the start of this part of the video, but reading up on the development of this game was such a cool experience for me. It adds much more context to the game itself and allows us as the players to appreciate more things about it. Of course, I'm not saying we should all download the game and then wait for the developer blog to come out about it, but reading up on that after we've played the game can further immerse us in the game in the best of cases, or in the worst of cases, it can serve as something that we turn to for clues or answers as to what happened that made the game a bad one. But thankfully, in this instance, this is a dev blog that explains how the game was developed and released so well. Now hold on just a minute, we're not quite done with the development section of this game just yet. When talking about how Toshiyuki said the team just managed to get the game onto two discs three weeks before the release date, I hinted that there was more than one version of this game. Which brings us to the international version of Ace Combat 3 Electrosphere. In order to discuss the development of the international version, we first need to quickly take a look at the release dates for both versions of the game. The Japanese release of Ace Combat 3 Electrosphere happened on May 27, 1999. The international version that we know today was released on January 21, 2000 in PAL regions and on March 3, 2000 in America. Some of you may be asking, why is there this big delay for the international version? What's up with that? That is because an official translation of this game was in the works during that time. The original plan was for the game to be released in Japan first, and while those sales were going on, a translation team would be brought on to translate the game in its entirety, then the game was scheduled to be released internationally after that. The task of translating this game was given to the translating company Frog Nation. Frog Nation then reached out to Agnes Kaku, a veteran Japanese translator for the purpose of helping out with this effort. So, the translation effort was in good hands. And then the funding was cut shortly after that. I was brought in to do a demo translation of a story chapter by people who were supposedly contracted to write the screenplay. Soon after, Namco decided to lighten the budget by ditching much or all of the plot content for the non-Japanese release. So then, what the hell happened with this translation? Agnes Kaku said that Namco decided to lighten the budget, which implies that it was done due to financial reasons. Even though no official statement to this day has been given by anyone, there's been a general consensus as to what happened. When Ace Combat 3 released in Japan, it wasn't making as much of a financial splash as Namco was hoping it would. Keep in mind, this was the most expensive Ace Combat game to be developed at this point. Multiple voice acted characters, larger battlefields, more complex AI programming, getting the most out of the graphics, 52 missions in the game when combining all of its routes, and so much more. And people need to be paid for their work. With how expensive Ace Combat 3 was to develop on its own, how much the translation efforts were going to cost, and with the company not getting its money back through their predicted sales goals not having been met, things were going in a downward spiral, financially speaking. So, in order to save money from what Namco had deemed a failure in terms of sales, they cut the funding for the official translation, which resulted in the half-baked international version that we have now. What makes this even worse is that the funding for the official translation was cut after advertisements were made for the official translation to audiences outside of Japan. In other words, people outside of Japan were first shown the Japanese version of the game and were told, see this? This is what you're going to get in a few months from now, but fully translated for you. So to go from that to being told, Actually, the translation is cancelled, you're going to be getting a poor man's version of this game. It's quite understandable that people were very upset at Namco. Yes! 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 No! 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 Fuck! Shit! 
But the cancellation went through anyway, things were adjusted, and the international version of the game released a few months later. Agnes Kaku also shares this same thinking that it was due to financial reasons. For whatever reason, though my admittedly biased view is that cutting the story didn't help, Ace Combat 3 didn't make quite the splash that a release of its size should have. All the pre-localization hype surrounding the massive storyline turned into a chorus of boos and then fading grouses when the change was announced, which meant that there wasn't a lot of interest left when the title was finally ready to ship. A shame, really, since gamers who did play it almost universally praised it, and it won a respectable number of players' choice distinctions. As for my thoughts on the matter, I have to agree with Agnes here. I also personally think that Namco should have toughed it out and gone through with the official translation. For one, they wouldn't have made their audience outside of Japan upset at them. And secondly, I feel like they could have been better off financially speaking, as I feel that Namco cutting the funding for the official translation ultimately hurt the game more and their wallets more than it helped. Including the international sales, Ace Combat 3 Electrosphere sold 1.164 million copies. I can't help but to feel like their total sales would have been higher if they stuck with it. Namco could have touted their sales figures if they stuck with it in the long run since the international sales would have done better in my eyes. Then again, I can't say that I'm too surprised at this decision given that companies, especially video game companies, like to think of the financial side of things in the short term and hardly ever think about how things might be better in the long run if they ease up a bit right then and there. Now, don't get me wrong, I know the whole point of a business is to make money, and when it comes to the finances of a company, thinking in the long term presents an element of not knowing if that gamble will pay off or fail hard. So, from the lens of being in the cold, brutal world that is the business world, I can see where that decision came from. I don't agree with it, but I can understand, as unfortunate as that decision was. Some of you with a keen attention to detail may have noticed that I was referring to the official translation of Ace Combat 3. Me using the word official means that some other translation efforts had to have happened at some point, right? Well, my fellow Ace pilots, you are correct. In 2009, a group of people known as Team Nemo got together and began a years-long mission to fully translate Ace Combat 3 into English. Managed by project manager Dragon Spike 13, or would it be Dragon Spike the 13th? While the team states that there isn't any roadmap or any kind of development blog regarding their journey of this process, they do provide some milestones. In 2009, the project began. 2010 through 2012 was spent digging and hacking through the game data, and in 2016 they released the first full translation of the game. Even though this full translation is with text only, as I would imagine Team Nemo didn't have the money to hire voice actors for this translation, it's still incredible to see all of the text translated. Of course, not every single single piece of text has been translated, as in the menus whenever there's text, it's more often than not in Japanese. But all of the in-game text has been translated so that those of you who aren't experienced with the language can understand what's going on in the game. This marks the first time that a game in the Ace Combat series has been translated, and I have to applaud Team Nemo for sticking with it for this long. Even though Ace Combat 3 didn't sell the best, and even though the game is one of the more divisive ones and opinions about it from what I've seen in the Ace Combat community, they still went through with it. It's because of their translation efforts that so many people are able to play this game. On that note, let's dive in and see what Ace Combat 3 has in store. Before we dive into the meat and potatoes of Ace Combat 3, we gotta get the shop talk out of the way first. What you're seeing on screen is me playing through both versions of the game through the EPSX e emulator, an emulator designed to emulate PlayStation 1 games. It was just a matter of downloading the emulator and... Hang on, what word did my lawyer tell me to use again? Ah, right acquiring the PlayStation 1 BIOS and the ISO files for both versions of Ace Combat 3 and adjusting the emulator settings to best fit the game. Shout out to Ace Combat fans' emulation tutorial on Ace Combat 3 for the settings he recommends with this game, by the way. It saved me a lot of time that would have otherwise been spent doing multiple trial and error runs. All right, with the shop talk out of the way now, let's get into the game. With this video being a retrospective instead of a review, I'll be breaking down both versions of the game in their entirety. I'll be covering the international version first and saving the Japanese version for after that. In other words, I'm saving the best for the second half. 
Before we do that though, let's focus on the core gameplay of flying around first before we get into any comparisons about the international version and the Japanese version. It would be unfair to start making comparisons right out the gate in my eyes. I'll talk about how both games are in terms of gameplay first, as that is identical across both versions aside from one key difference. You can definitely tell that this is an earlier Ace Combat title with the handling and the general pace and flow of combat, but not in a bad way. More so, it's different. The aircraft themselves feel pretty different to fly, as in the general dynamics of flying around are much different. For instance, in modern Ace Combat titles, you can be rapidly ascending with the nose of your aircraft pointed upward with hardly a loss of speed. But in Ace Combat 3, suddenly pointing your nose up toward the sky will result in you gradually losing speed and even going into a stall if you're not careful. The general handling of Ace Combat 3 feels a bit different too, but in a good way I would argue. For example, the starter aircraft fit their role really well. Starter aircraft can still get the job done, but their stats are low enough to where it makes a big difference when you start flying the late game aircraft. Regardless of the aircraft that you choose though, Ace Combat 3 nails the pace of its gameplay in both versions. There are plenty of moments where you'll be taking things slow and steady, particularly when engaging in air-to-air -air combat as you circle around to engage the next target, firing your missiles and watching to ensure that they connect, or if needed, to fire another pair of missiles to finish your target off. But there will be other times when the action is faster paced, such as attacking a string of ground or naval threats, engaging an enemy aerial command ship doing hit and run maneuvers, or when you acquire the late game aircraft with higher stats across the board, enabling the pace of combat to increase as a result. Speaking of attacking targets though, Let's talk about the missiles. The missiles in Ace Combat 3 have one of two modes. They either have godlike tracking that can hunt down a target doing even the craziest of evasive maneuvers, or the missile tracking can go into smooth brain mode and miss entirely even when the enemy is not taking any evasive maneuvers. There's no in-between here. This led to me often firing up to four missiles at one target as it was a roll of the dice at times as to whether or not the missiles would hit. This is a case of this being an older Ace Combat title though, as starting from Ace Combat 4 and onward, you're able to get a pretty solid sense of whether the missiles will hit their target. Here in Ace Combat 3 though, it can be a bit of a mess at times, I will admit. There were moments when I found myself asking how in the world an attack didn't hit, and there was the once in a blue moon moment of me getting frustrated at missiles not hitting, but it never got to the point where where it damaged the core gameplay experience for me, thankfully. Besides, having an excuse to fire all four missiles at one target and watch as all four of them hit the enemy can be pretty darn satisfying. Speaking of missiles and weaponry in general, let's talk about the special weapons. Ace Combat 3 introduced the concept of special weapons for the first time in the series. Most of the aircraft of the game allows you to pick between different types of cannons, often trading firing rate for damage and vice versa, and allowing you to pick between different types of missiles and unguided bombs. Later Ace Combat games would expand on the concept by giving a wider range of special weapons to use and, in general, providing more flexibility. But it's nice to be able to see it in the game that debuted this feature to the series. The difficulty seemed to be very balanced as well. I played through both versions of the game on normal difficulty, and it seemed like normal difficulty. A great middle ground between easy and hard. Enemies would still attack if they got the chance, they'd take evasive maneuvers, and plenty of times I had to put up a fight in order to shoot an enemy down. The last two things I want to cover before we move on are the visuals and audio of the game. On the visual side of things, yeah, it definitely looks like a PlayStation 1 game today, but when compared to the graphics of Air Combat and Ace Combat 2, this game is leagues better in this department. I think the visuals speak for themselves on this matter. The audio has received huge improvements from the previous two games as well. The explosions have more oomph to them, you can hear the sound of passing fighter jets more clearly, and even the audio for when you're locking onto a target really adds on to the game gameplay, I would argue, to give three examples.
The soundtrack of this game is unique too, one of if not the most unique out of the series I would argue. The first two games had a heavy rock focus to the soundtracks. Meanwhile here in Ace Combat 3, the best way that I can describe this music is futuristic, which makes sense, futuristic to match how far into the future this game takes place. It fits the tone and setting of the game really well, which is crucial to giving the player those extra means of confidence when playing through the game. Shout out to Tetsukazu Nakanishi for the production of this game's music, he really nailed it excellently here. Alright, now it's time for the comparisons to start. I'll be hinting at certain things the Japanese version has that the international version doesn't, and I'll go into more detail about those things when we get to the second half of the video. The one difference between the two versions gameplay-wise is that the international version lets you pick from a list of aircraft that you can take on any mission. Meanwhile, in the Japanese version, you're limited to specific aircraft depending on the faction that you're a part of. Now then, on to the story. The international version of Ace Combat 3 takes place in the Ace Combat world of Strange Real on the continent of Yuzia. The year is 2040, where corporations have surpassed the powers of traditional governments. The idea of countries and governments have been abolished as mega corporations have such vast amounts of power and influence that their policies dictate how the world goes nowadays. The two big corporations out of them all are General Resource and New Work the latter of the two being known as New Calm in the Japanese version. General Resource and New Work are in a cold war as they're fighting for economic dominance. In the middle of these two companies is UPO, the Universal Peace Enforcement Organization. UPO serves the role as being the authority figure for Yuzia as it's their goal to maintain peace between the two corporations. Given that both General Resource and New Work both have their own private military forces, and given how both companies want the other out of the picture for total economic dominance, well... The reason for UPO existing to begin with starts to make a bit of sense. UPO consists of people who aren't from General Resource or New Work. Rather, they serve the Neo United Nations, or NUN for short. It's UPO's responsibility to maintain peace in Yuzia, fighting whoever threatens it. In the international version, you play as an unnamed pilot who flies for UPO, being sent on various missions, fighting on behalf of and fighting against both General Resource and New Work. The story in this game is non-existent. Whereas the Japanese version has an actual story thanks to voice acted characters, cutscenes, and choices for the player to make, the international version is a linear poor man's version. There's no voice acting whatsoever, instead having just text showing up on the screen during missions. Oh. 
and due to the story from the Japanese version being removed entirely for this version, there wasn't enough time to make any new cutscenes or record any new voice acted lines for the game. So they replaced those cutscenes and voice acted lines with walls of text. I'm not kidding. Hey, yo, what the fuck? Every once in a while, either after or before a mission, you get a title card followed up by paragraphs of what's going on in the story. No cutscenes, no voice acted lines, just text. Now, does a game have to have cutscenes to portray a story well? Not necessarily, no. Project Wingman, for example, that game doesn't have any cutscenes, but it's able to tell its story through the mission briefings and in-game events. Here in the international version of Ace Combat 3, though, no such in-game storytelling methods are found here. You're just doing missions to unlock paragraphs of text. The missions themselves barely have any connection with this story. Yeah, there will be the Once in a Blue Moon mission that's mentioned in one of these mini essays, but the vast majority of those missions have nothing to do with the story. You're just attacking either general resource or new work just to have something to do while this thing I have to legally call a story takes a back seat. Hell, they don't even introduce the hidden enemy faction of the game or Boros in a good way. They name drop this faction in a debriefing after the mission counterterrorism in the campaign as if we're supposed to know who they are already. And after the name drop and after a whole new mission, is when they finally get around to explaining who the hell this faction is. Instead of having Ouroboros reveal themselves with a big speech like in the Japanese version, the international version just makes you read about them. The international version of Ace Combat 3 commits the biggest cardinal sin of visual storytelling by telling us the story rather than showing it. You know the saying, show don't tell? Yeah, this version of the game gets a D rank in storytelling, and I'm only sparing it an F rank because both versions of Ace Combat 3 don't have F ranks. Long story short, a new work AI by the name of Aurora becomes self-aware and sparks a war between general resource and new work, with you as the UPO pilot being caught in the middle trying to combat hostilities between the two companies during the campaign. At first, it seems like both companies were just pushed over the edge after New Work began aggressively pushing into general resources territory starting in the first mission, but no. It turns out Aurora sparks the war so it could reduce the possibility of the other three factions of the game coming together to stop it. And do you want to know how this revelation occurs? No, not through gameplay. Nah, not through a cutscene. It's through a f***ing text wall! So you chase after Aurora, shoot down the people the program has taken control of, the game attempts to push a forced last minute humanity versus machines kind of thing, you fight this program through way too many levels before the game decides to say screw it and gives you a demonstration of what being on LSD is like by taking you to the electrosphere, which given Ace Combat 3's lore of how the electrosphere works, this shouldn't even be possible since you are a flesh and blood human here, not a sublimated digital copy of yourself. You shoot down Aurora and the game ends. And notice how I skipped three fourths of the whole plot of you fighting against general resource and new work at first because it would just be mission summaries instead of plot summaries because no story happens in the missions. You just fly around destroying targets while the story of the game is given to you through the text walls while mysterious music is going do 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 like we're watching an episode of the Twilight Zone or some shit. It's supposed to get our attention and have us super intrigued or something. Which no, it doesn't. This story is pathetic. That being said, we do need to recognize the situation. It was Namco's decision to cut the funding, meaning the people in charge of the international version most likely had no choice but to do this. It's best to have some story attached to the game, no matter how poorly it's told, than to have no story at all. As upset as I am that the story in the international version is so pathetically sad and awful, it is important to know that this most likely isn't what the developers wanted either. We can rightfully get upset about how bad the international version is when it comes to the story. That is an objective fact. But when we get to the part of looking for someone to blame, it's important to realize that it was Namco's leadership that shot down the international version's potential, not the developers. Again, as much as I disagree with it, I can understand why Namco pulled the funding for the official translation. But part of me wonders what the international version of this game could have been if it had gone through. We can get an idea of it today thanks to Team Nemo, and I'm not trying to downplay Team Nemo's efforts when I say this, but part of me wonders how different Ace Combat 3 would have been received, and how different Ace Combat 3's history would have been as a whole if Namco had toughed it out. There's no real point in dwelling on it, but it's something I've been thinking about every now and then while working on this video. Apologies if this part of the video seems to be ending abruptly, but 
there's nothing else for me to talk about here. This version of the game is shallow, which means this part of the video is too. Well, actually, you know what? Before we move on, I do have a few more closing thoughts that I want to give for the international version. The Japanese version of Ace Combat 3 is where the ambition and innovation for this game truly shines, not only in the gameplay, but particularly in the story. Starting off with the gameplay, it's interchangeable with the international version except for two key differences in regards to aircraft selection and exclusive missions depending on which route you take. In the international version, you're able to pick any aircraft at any time. With the Japanese version, you're limited to a select number of aircraft depending on which faction you're a part of, which will get to that part next. At a first glance, it may seem like this game is restricting the freedom of aircraft and weaponry choices, and initially, that's what I was worried about too. Even though this game came out many years after Ace Combat 3, I got some PTSD flashbacks to Assault Horizon and how that game limited your aircraft selection, forcing you to pick among a small list of aircraft for the mission. However, Ace Combat 3 does this limited aircraft selection in a great way. Firstly, it gives you a healthy selection of aircraft to choose from to start out, with more aircraft being gradually added as you go down that path with those aircraft being from different categories as well, unlike Assault Horizon that limits you to only one class of fighter depending on the mission. When did this become Ace Combat 3 Electrosphere versus Ace Combat Assault Horizon? I don't know. But I'm not gonna turn down an opportunity to talk shit about Call of Duty, I mean Ace Combat Assault Horizon. Anyway, focusing back on Ace Combat 3. The second thing the limited aircraft selection does well is that it represents the faction you're a part of. What do I mean by this? Each faction has its own exclusive aircraft that you can't fly with any other faction. For example, you can only fly the Su-43 Burkut if you fly with Yupio. You can only fly the F-22C Raptor 2 with General Resource. You can only fly the R-103 Delphinus No. 3 with Nucom. You can only fly the XFA-36A game if you stick with either General Resource or Ouroboros, Ouroboros being the fourth hidden faction in the game. Even if you do the same thing with each aircraft of flying around and destroying the target, that cross your path, the different exclusive aircrafts of the faction make you feel that much more a part of that group. This also introduces exclusive missions depending on which faction you're a part of, for obvious reasons, adding tons of replay value to the game. Now that we discussed the key differences gameplay-wise, let's move on to the story. This is where things get really good. The Japanese version of the game also takes place in Strange Real on the continent of Yuzia during the year 2040. Once again, countries and governments have been cast aside as mega corporations have an insane amount of influence and power here. General Resource and Newcom, God, it feels so much better to say Newcom instead of new work for some reason, are trying to gain total economic power, which leads to their armed forces itching for a fight. Caught in the middle is Yupio, who also has the mission of peacekeeping duties in this version as they do their best to prevent an all-out war between the two corporations. Now, unlike the international version where it's a linear story with only one path and one ending, the Japanese version of this game introduces one of the biggest innovations to the series in the form of not only having multiple endings, but allowing the player to make critical decisions that influence which 
which ending they'll get. When Agnes Kaku referred to this game getting a number of player's choice distinctions, this is what she was referring to. These choices the player can make are either small or big. For example, a small change would be deviating from the primary objective to help out your wingman, thus getting a different mission ending and debriefing than if you had stuck to the primary objective. A big change on the other hand comes in the form of changing sides. All routes in Ace Combat 3 start with Yupio, but after certain missions, you can choose to either stick with your current faction or follow someone else to change sides. In total, there are four different factions you can fly with in five different endings depending on who you side with. There's also a sixth hidden ending if you complete all of the routes and get all of the various endings, but we'll touch on that ending later. Being able to change sides and being able to achieve multiple endings is already impressive enough for this game. However, Ace Combat 3 goes above and beyond with these routes because each route has its own theme, its own underlying message, and its own personal story to tell among the overarching story of the whole game. On that note, let's begin by taking a look at the Yupio route first. Yupio is the faction that every route starts with. It's the faction that not only tries to maintain peace among the continent of Yuzia, but it represents a bygone age. How things used to be done the Old World Order. Yupio is led by Gabriel W. Clarkson, someone from the age of when countries, governments, and politics were still the norm. Clarkson is one to still try to use these old ways of thinking to negotiate for peace between conflicts, and he tries that method when things start heating up between General Resource and Newcom during the Intercorporate War. The wingmen who fly with you as members of Yupio have their own personal reasons for flying, but they still ultimately believe in the idea of Yupio being able to maintain peace and order. Fiona wholeheartedly believes in Yupio's ideals and goals, personally believing that a group like Yupio still has a place in this day and age. Eric Jaeger, who, fun fact, is the son of Jaeger from Ace Combat 7, initially starts off not having much of a personal reason to fly, instead focusing on Yupio's main goals as his reasoning. Lastly, there's Rena, with her main reason being that she has more of a connection with her aircraft when flying. Rena was born with a life-threatening condition called Silverstone disease, which means her body can't survive exposure to sunlight. Each time she would need to go outside, to say how she described it, she would need to suit up as if she was going into space in order to survive. She finds comfort in being able to fly, being able to be one with her aircraft while serving Yupio. And I mean that in the literal sense. All of the aircraft in Ace Combat 3 have the coffin, or connection for flight interface, cockpit. Aircraft equipped with coffin cockpits allow the pilot to control the aircraft with their thoughts and body movements instead of the traditional flight stick and buttons. So when I say that Rena finds comfort in being one with her aircraft, she becomes that aircraft essentially, as do all other pilots in Ace Combat 3 when they take to the skies. Rena just finds more significant meaning in flying in part due to her body being so fragile. As for the main theme of this route, the theme here is believing in the old world order and peacekeeping. It's made clear in the story that Yupio is not very well equipped to be able to handle conflicts as large as this one. They do their best to solve issues through diplomacy, but when the use of deadly force is required, they send in groups like SARF, the Special Armed Response Force, to get the job done. A lot of the time in these missions, it's more so damage control rather than peacekeeping. Each time Yupio's SARF squad Squadron is sent, most of the time it's a matter of trying to prevent or control the damage. Your allegiance to Yupio is tested quite a bit throughout this campaign, with two cases in particular being defining moments. The first of these two big moments is in the ending to the mission Paper Tiger. After participating in a joint operation with General Resource to strike at Newcom's floating city Megafloat, Abyssal Dissian, General Resource's main ace pilot, tempts you to join the company. Dissian believes that a pilot of your caliber would go to waste serving Yupio, and says that if you follow him, he'll lead the way to establish the new world order. Do you still believe in the old world order, or do you think that organizations like Yupio are from a truly bygone age, and it's time to advance to humanity's next chapter? The second of these tests is in the missions Scylla and Charybdis. I'm pretty sure I butchered the pronunciation of that name, where you and Eric are escorting Delegate Clarkson to a peace conference in the middle of a temporary ceasefire between General Resource and Newcom. After you defend Clarkson from General Resource forces looking to assassinate him, the commander of UPO's armed forces, Commander Park, says that Clarkson's behavior has shown that he and your wingman Fiona are engaging in espionage. The circumstances of this revelation are dubious, to say the least. Jamming from an unknown source kicks in at the beginning of the mission, 
action, and Rena, along with another UPO pilot, comes in just after the battle right behind them. Then, you are ordered to shoot down the delegates' personal plane. This is the second test of your allegiance to UPO. This time, rather than being confronted with believing in either the old or new world order, this dilemma is simply a matter of whether you think this is of best interest for UPO. If it's true that Clarkson and Fiona are engaging in espionage, looking to dethrone UPO, then it would be the best course of action to shoot them down. Regardless of whether you shoot the plane down yourself, or if Rena does it for you, if you take too long to decide, you're in it for the long haul now. This is also when Eric's reasons for flying are tested. He was flying for UPO's ideals and beliefs. Seeing not only Delegate Clarkson, but one of his closest wingmen and friends, Fiona, shot down, really messes with him. The next mission, Eric is dejected, asking himself why he's even flying for UPO still. Rena responds that Eric is doing it for the sake of flying, further reinforcing her own reasoning for flying. If it means being able to fly more, then Rena has no problems with shooting down Clarkson if you won't, and doesn't show any sign of remorse at first. Rena eventually plainly explains that she did what she did because flying is important to her. Even so, she realizes she'll probably never be forgiven by you or Eric. Rena's beliefs are challenged as well, though. In the mission Bug Hunt, you're tasked with exterminating nanobites. These nanobites are, among other things, able to take over someone else's mind and make them a robot. This is important because this is what Rena has been wishing for. Well, kind of. Her true goal is to be able to discard her body and live on in some other way, shape, or form. Be it in the electrosphere as a piece of human software, a robot, anything. And it makes sense why she would want to do this. Her whole life, her body has been eliminated limitation to her thanks to her having Silverstone disease. Her cursed body has been a burden on her, forcing her to have gone through test after test after test growing up, and she was most likely seen as the odd one out in places like school, for example. Her body has given her so much trouble throughout her entire life that she wants nothing more than to get rid of it somehow. That is, until her mind nearly gets taken over by the nanobites. The nanobites are able to gradually take control of your plane if you get too close to them, and given how in Ace Combat 3, pilots control their aircraft with their minds and bodies, if the aircraft gets taken over, so too does that pilot's mind. This was the very thing that Rena wanted at first, to become something other than human. Even if it meant she was a machine, she wanted nothing more than to discard her Silverstone disease-stricken body. But when her goal is put to the test, that shakes her up, to the point where she looks at herself differently after that mission, fully embracing herself instead of wishing she was something else entirely. As for Eric, rather than leaning on Yupio's ideals and beliefs as his reasoning for flying, he finds his own personal reasons, that being restoring Yupio to its former glory and former mission statement when all hell breaks loose a few missions later. This is what drives him to be able to continue flying, even when the situation for Yuzia and Yupio as a whole gets a lot worse. With Eric's and Rena's personal conflicts having been resolved, now it's time for Yupio's conflict to be resolved as well. Commander Park he is not someone who wants peace. He wants to have power. He wants to rule with an iron fist. This is hinted at in the intro cinematic, where he grins evilly as he knocks over a chess piece as he takes his turn. This becomes clear as day in the very fittingly titled mission Pawns in the Game, where you, Eric, and Rena all fly Newcom fighters in not Yupio's colors, but Newcom's colors instead. At first, this seems odd, because it is. We are told that we're suppressing a general resource armory to reduce 
reduce the company's war potential and therefore decrease the possibility of an all-out war. But why are we flying with Newcom's colors while doing this? After the mission is done, it's revealed that this was all a setup. General Resource thinks Newcom blatantly attacked them without cause, while Newcom says that General Resource performed a false flag operation to make them look like the aggressors. Commander Park used Yupio to ignite an all-out war, siding with the underground organization Ouroboros as the two want to see Yuzia burn to ashes, albeit with two different end goals in mind. With Ouroboros revealing themselves as the one who sparked the initial conflicts between the two conglomerates, with the help of Commander Park using Yupio to keep the hostilities going until the powder keg exploded, it becomes clear that Yupio and its soldiers were abused. Yupio started the very all-out war they intended to prevent. Upon realizing this, you, Eric, and Rena all get together to reinstate the peace that had been unintentionally ripped away. The three of you crush Ouroboros first, downing their airborne fortress serving as their headquarters and shooting down the group's leader, Dissian, the pilot from earlier who tempted you to join General Resource. With Ouroboros having been neutralized, and with both General Resource and Yukon having ceased hostilities after the true nature of the war was revealed to them, all that's left is to eliminate the Yupio forces still loyal to Commander Park. After Park and his followers are wiped out, the game ends on a bittersweet note. Yupio is in shambles. You and Eric aren't sure what to do or where to go next. Rena was shot down while fighting Ouroboros' HQ, but she's alive and well as revealed by the ending cutscene, and there's a general sense of uncertainty. Despite that feeling though, Yupio has redeemed itself. You, Rena, and Eric, as pilots of Yupio, restored peace to Yuzia. The general resource route represents the new way forward. If you choose to follow Dissian and join general resource, you're doing much more than just changing sides. You're saying that the old way of politics, countries, governments, all of that has passed. It's time to move on and embrace the new world order. It's time for you to join the company that has become dominant in all sectors of the world. For this path, the two characters that this route focuses the most on are Abyssal Dissian and Keith Bryan. We'll save the in-depth look into to Dissian for later, as his personal story stretches way beyond the general resource path. Instead, we'll be focusing on Keith. After your official transfer from UPO to general resource, Dissian places you in his unit alongside Keith. Keith doesn't take too kindly to this at first. He doesn't think highly of anyone from Yupio, seeing them as mediocre at best. When he sends his first video mail to you, he even openly makes a comment that you are nobody special, and that the way you flew in Yupio won't cut it for being a part of Dissian's team, let alone for being a part of the company. However, as you two go on more missions together, Keith starts to ease up on you as you get to unleash your full potential. So much so that when you make it to the latter half of the general resource route, Keith openly admits that you're better than him, and you've earned so much respect that he even considers you a close friend. You can see it in his words, facial expressions, and general attitude how he goes from writing you off as an ex-UPO pilot to not only accepting you as an ace pilot of general resource, but also a friend. よし、ユリ。確かにお前の腕は全ラルでも中の下ぐらいであることは認めてやる。だがな、ディジョンにちょっとばかし気に入られているからってでかい顔はするな。お前と奴ではレベルが全く違う。俺にはまた奴がどうい
well, stratosphere. You can either continue to focus on the primary objective at hand, or cast the mission aside in favor of helping out your wingman. Either way, Keith makes it through that encounter alive, but he expresses his thanks if you choose to save him. Yeah, what makes the close bond between you and Keith even more powerful is that after the mission Dilemma, Dissian declares that he's leaving General Resource to join Ouroboros and just leaves like that. If you choose to stay with General Resource, Keith is distraught when you two make it back to base, as Dissian was his close friend for years at that point. To suddenly have your close friend leave you with no explanation whatsoever would really mess with you, I would imagine. At this point, Keith has no one to turn to but you as he voices his anger. Keith's personal conflict isn't in regard to any beliefs or ideals. He's perfectly content flying for general resource. His personal story involves the acceptance of you into the team and how he goes from hating your guts to you being the only other pilot he can fully trust when the world is suddenly turned upside down for him. If it hasn't been made clear enough already, Keith is my favorite character in this game. Ace Combat 3 nails the growing bond between you and Keith throughout the campaign and is what I would argue makes the general resource route stand out among the others. Yeah, there's the theme of moving on from the old way of doing things by defecting from UPO to general resource and believing in general resources total dominance in all sectors of the world, but the mission to mission gameplay wouldn't have been as fun as it was without having the best wingman in this game helping you out. <laughs> What's interesting about the Newcom route in terms of how you join that faction is that you more so suddenly become a member of the company out of the blue rather than joining it on your own. Going back to the mission Scylla and Charybdis, I probably butchered the pronunciation a second time just now, if you decide to shoot down the allied fighter accompanying Rena instead of shooting down Clarkson's plane, a squadron of Newcom fighters will swoop in and join you in escorting the plane. From there, you're guided to a Newcom airbase where you officially transfer from UPO to Newcom. It may seem like a Pretty sudden transition, but think about it. You just got attacked by General Resource and you just shot down one of your allies, meaning returning to UPO is no longer an option either. You have no choice but to go to Newcom at this point. Once you officially transfer, the cast of characters for this group is focused on Fiona and her sister, Cynthia. Where did Eric go, you may be asking? Eric just kinda went, I'm dead! Ah! No, seriously. He just vanishes from the story this point onward. He doesn't give you a call when you transfer to Newcom, he doesn't go with you on future missions, he's just gone. Focusing back on the two that still exist in the physical plane of the universe, we have Fiona and Cynthia. Fiona manages to take the sudden change of flying for Newcom now rather well. She doesn't appear to be at all distraught that what she's flying for is no longer to maintain peace between the two companies. I think a big part of why she's able to take this sudden change so well is that she's now flying alongside her sister Cynthia. Cynthia has been a part of Newcom from the beginning, believing in their technology-focused mindsets as she believes experimenting with new tech is the way forward. General Resource does this as well, but Newcom takes the obsession with futuristic technology to the extreme. This is why Newcom stands out among the other factions in the game for being the most technologically advanced one out of them all. Their aircrafts are unlike anything we've seen in terms of aircraft design. Oftentimes, instead of cannons, we have pulse lasers to replace them. There's even a mission in the Newcom route where you take a starfighter and go to space to shoot down general resource satellites. The theme of the Newcom route is focusing on the technology of the future to an obsessive degree while also challenging you on your stance of sublimation, which we'll get to in a second. While Newcom is a sizable company, sizable enough to challenge general resource for economic dominance, Newcom is more so focused on the cutting edge technology of the future. Cynthia believes in Newcom's beliefs, ideals, and mindset wholeheartedly, while Fiona believes there should be some limits set in place. In particular, with the technology of sublimation. For those of you who don't know what sublimation is, strap yourselves in because it is some eerily fascinating stuff. 
Sublimation is the process of creating a digital copy of yourself. Your mind, your personality, everything that makes you who you are copied and uploaded onto some sort of computer network. Essentially, a copy of you living as a piece of software instead of in a human body. Cynthia believes that sublimation is the way forward, while Fiona believes that the technology is too dangerous, claiming that sublimation is playing God. ニューコムで実験を予定してるサブリメーションの被験者にねえさんは体や心まで捨てようとしているんじゃないのまた実験も成功していないサブリメーションなんて無茶よ一体何が知りたいの誰もが進むべき次なる世界そうまだ誰も体験したことのない全てが新しく未知の知覚や感覚によって
これを聞いても信じないかもしれないでもエレクトロスフィアは確かにあるそして素晴らしい At long last, it's time to take a look at the Ouroboros path. Firstly, what even is Ouroboros? I've hinted at this being a shadowy underground sort of faction. That is because of Ouroboros' goal. Ouroboros is a group of transhumanists who believe that sublimation is the next stage of human evolution, and that the current state of the world is holding mankind back from achieving that goal. The constraints of being a flesh and blood human being don't exist when you're sublimated in the electrosphere. Your body doesn't need food, water, and sleep to be maintained because you don't have a body to maintain when sublimated. Beyond that, the group believes that humanity will be better off sublimated because they believe the wants of the world have corrupted the planet. The reason their movement is so forceful is because Ouroboros knows that not everyone likes the idea of undergoing sublimation. People like Fiona, for example, flat out reject the idea and stand firmly against it. In order to achieve their goal of the sublimation of all humanity, this revolution of theirs has to be a forceful one. Most likely, Ouroboros plans to force everyone to undergo sublimation before killing the flesh and blood version of everyone before eventually finishing themselves off too, leaving Yuzia and eventually the whole world totally abandoned, not a single hint of mankind as everyone would be living in the electrosphere. The person to lead this group? None other than Abyssal Dissian. When you first meet Dissian in the game, he seems like just the ace of general resource and nothing more. And when you learn of him being the leader of the group in other routes, it can be a bit of a head-scratcher at first. Playing through the general resource route, then following Dissian to Ouroboros sheds some much-needed light. When you talk with Dissian throughout your time at general resource, he seems like your normal commanding superior in appearance. He generally seems like a flesh-and-blood human being. When Ouroboros begins their uprising, however, this is when a true revelation is made. しかし、この人間が全ての欲を捨てることのできる唯一の手段を私だけが知っている。そう、本当の私にはすでに肉体など存在していない。今君が見ている私の姿はかつて私自身のデータが構築されたころの。記録を再現しているだけなのだ。君もサブリメーションという言葉を知っているだろう。人間の精神や心、魂といった物理的な存在ではない情報だけを抽出し、電子によるネットワーク上で生命として起動させる技術だ。Dissian is a sublimated copy. He always has been throughout this game, and later in the general resource Ouroboros route, we find out how he became sublimated. Back when Dissian was still a flesh and blood human being, he had a love interest by the name of Yoko. Yoko was heading the research efforts of sublimation at general resource. Dissian got the special privilege of being the first one to be officially sublimated by Yoko. In the midst of that though, general resource had deemed the research too dangerous to continue, which resulted in them... Let's just say, terminating Yoko and her research. おはよう。
なんだこいつらは爆破する気かターゲットは確認したか2人しかいませんよし負け添えはあの男だけで十分あと30秒撤収テロかヨーコ逃げろヨーコダメだ聞こえないヨーコヨーコ早く早く気づいてくれヨーコヨーコヨーコなぜ俺はまだ死んでいないんだヨーコお前は俺に何をしたんだ Along with us being able to see how Dissian became sublimated, we also get some context as to the immediate first thoughts of a sublimated person. Notice how the sublimated Dissian yells at Yoko that the flesh and blood Dissian is not him, how he was trying to warn Yoko of the explosive that had been planted right outside her door, and how he's confused as to what happened to him once Yoko and the flesh and blood Dissian are killed. This leads us to conclude that when someone is sublimated, they think of themselves as the true person. The sublimated Dissian said his flesh and blood self wasn't really him. The real him was in the electrosphere. Now, over time, Dissian learned the truth about what happened, coming to terms with the fact that he was at one point a flesh and blood human. After all, according to when the game takes place, this all happened to Dissian 10 years ago. 10 years is quite a lot of time to figure something out, and 10 years is quite a lot of time to get used to being in the electrosphere. Did Dissian figure out that living as a sublimated copy of himself in the electrosphere was much better, believing that all of humanity should live like this too? Or is there a different motive to his goals? To answer that question, we need to take a break from Dissian and focus our attention back to Cynthia. If you decide to go down the Newcom Ouroboros route, you will join Ouroboros alongside Cynthia. Dissian will still be present as the faction's leader, but he takes more of a backseat in this route. At first, Cynthia's resolve has never been stronger. In the first mission she goes on as a member of Ouroboros, that mission being to grab Rena so she can fly the Night Raven, you can tell she's more determined than ever. She even personally thanks you for deciding to join her despite not being able to explain very well what was going on when you joined Ouroboros. As a result, Cynthia says that no matter what happens, she'll look after you. After you rescue Rena, though, Cynthia gets confused. The revolution seems to be going after just random targets, participating in these skirmishes here and there. Cynthia confronts Dissian about this, saying she doesn't understand why they're wasting time with seemingly unimportant targets. This leads Dissian to revealing the fact that he hates being sublimated. When he says he didn't choose to be sublimated, I mean, that is a true fact. The flesh and blood Dissian wanted to be sublimated, but the copy of Dissian doesn't want to be there. Being unaware of all that had happened at General Resource those 10 years ago, Cynthia's world gets turned upside down. She realizes that Dissian doesn't want humanity to be sublimated because he feels it's the next stage of human evolution, and he doesn't see the electrosphere as a paradise, even if he's been preaching that publicly. Deep down, Dissian just wants to watch the world burn for what happened to him. It's in this route that Cynthia's beliefs on being sublimated change drastically. Previously, Cynthia thought of the electrosphere as a paradise, a heaven of sorts, where she would be able to roam freely without the constraints of a human body. But upon hearing how Dissian, the very man she looked up to as inspiration for wanting to be sublimated, states how he hates being in the electrosphere, she no longer wants to be sublimated. この世界を変えるのはこのような戦いではなく、ディジョン、あなた自身の姿であり、人々のサブリメーションではないのですか。ナイトレーベンなど使わなくても、あなたが自らの手で人々にエレクトロスフィアの素晴らしさを解くべき
前の話はエレクトロスフィアの世界が天国だとでも言いたいようにしか聞こえないそんなに天国へ逃げたいのなら妹の後でも追えばいいいやいやこんな私にいつも言ってた夢なら寝てる時にでも見ろとでもあなたのおかげで分かった目覚めの悪い夢 You and Cynthia then team up against Ouroboros, wiping out the aerial fortress, Dysian, and Rena. After you shoot down Rena, a man by the name of Simon says that you two have been forgiven and are able to return to the company, in fact, ordering you to do so. But the route ends with Cynthia saying that it's up to you whether or not you two should return to Newcom or fly to somewhere else. She says that no matter what you decide, she'll follow you. Except. There's something not quite right about that ending cutscene. Cynthia asks you where to go, but upon hearing no response, she asks you if you can hear her. At first, this may be chalked up to the main character being a silent protagonist. After all, the protagonists in Air Combat, Ace Combat 2, and the international version of Ace Combat 3 are all silent. At first, that may appear to be what's going on, but then when you look at all of the routes, things start getting more and more weird. For example, in the general resource route, in the mission Betrayal, you have a moment where seemingly irrelevant conversations happen in the background. これに何をした。ほら見て、こっちを見てる。あと30。なぜお前はまだ死んでいないのか。君のコピーはあっちに。もう終わったんだろ。私が見える。俺たちは。お前は誰だ。私が見える。ボーガー。やめろ。私が見える。まだ死んでいる。私が見える。またい。逃がすかよ。The screen goes haywire for a bit before everything suddenly returns to normal. Keith asks if everything is alright, assuming you had zoned out or were close to blacking out. In the mission Arch Nemesis in the Ouroboros route, you see what at first appears to be a cutscene of Rena's repressed memories that she is somehow remembering now. But then, she acknowledges that someone is peeking into her mind. And then those memories are seemingly erased. Then, Dissian suddenly accuses you of being an enemy. But wait a minute. We're on Dissian's side in the Ouroboros route. Why are we fighting him? After completing all routes of the game and getting all of the endings, this is when the biggest revelation of them all is made through the hidden ending. やっとまた会えたな。どうだ。もう気がついているのかもしれないが、お前は私によって作られたプログラムだったのだ。そしてこれまで。お前が見てきた全ての出来事。この私がお前を are not playing as a human. You are playing as a piece of AI in a simulated war. All of the missions all of the aircraft, all of the characters and their motivations, it's all a simulation. Well, mostly While all of the routes in this game have huge differences from one another, there is one key thing that's consistent among them. The sublimated Dissian gets killed in each one. Or rather, I should say that the sublimated Dissian gets deleted from the electrosphere in each one. With this, we can reason that Simon, the one who created this AI program, has something against him. The cutscene ends with Simon saying that you've done an excellent job and that it's time for you to be released into the real world, to presumably wipe out the real 
still sublimated Dissian from the electrosphere. This is why I said mostly everything was a simulation. Yoko and Dissian being killed by general resource forces halting the research into sublimation did happen. A sublimated abyssal Dissian does exist, but the inner corporate war was all a simulation for the AI program to be tested in. Having made it through the war each time with multiple factions to join, Simon believes his AI has enough combat efficiency to wipe out Dissian in the real world. So then, what is the reasoning for Simon to do this? <laughs> Wait. What? Is that... Is... Is that really the reason? So, I... Uh, okay, okay, hold on, hold on. Let me get this straight. Simon and Yoko were close, but Yoko was already in a relationship with Dissian. Then, when they both died at the hands of General Resource, Simon puts the blame on Dissian and is so distraught that he goes out of his way to create an AI program capable of skillful aerial combat just to wipe out Dissian for good, when Dissian wasn't even the one responsible for Yoko's death as he was just at the wrong place at the wrong time. What the f- Simon is such a simp for Yoko that he feels compelled enough to spend what I presume to be years creating this highly advanced AI program all for the sake of eliminating one sublimated copy of a person because he feels like Dissian is the one that killed Yoko when, once again, it was General Resource and these people, not this guy, THESE PEOPLE who made the explody boom boom box go beep boop for a bit before the numbers began to count down before exploding. What has me so dumbfounded at this revelation isn't the fact that Simon wants revenge on the person who took his love interest. Or supposedly because again, it wasn't f***ing Dissian. If I had a lover and that lover was taken away from me by someone, I would be totally fine facing a possible life sentence if it meant that I... Well, I, okay, I can't exactly say it in this video because if I do, then this video will at best get age restricted and at worst it'll get taken down entirely, but you know what I mean, right? It's the fact that after all this time, Simon still blames Dissian for it. Dissian wasn't the one who called up General Resource and recommended this course of action be taken. He wasn't the one to arm the explosive and he definitely wasn't luring Yoko into her lab only to undergo sublimation and then make out with her afterwards to buy time for the team to make their way inside the lab to do the job. As I stated earlier, Dissian was just at the wrong place at the wrong time. I'm not trying to say that revenge stories aren't feasible in video games. A story-driven video game where you have to solve a murder mystery, for example, or when you're someone else's pawn for the sake of revenge, can do wonders for a game story. It can work really well still. It's just so silly to me that Simon puts the blame not on general resource, but Dissian and Dissian only. You know what, though? To Ace Combat 3's credit, this revelation is still better than relying on the overused internal political struggle in Russia featuring Russian rebels plot that Assault Horizon has. Focusing back on Ace Combat 3, there is one more thing in relation to the story that I wanted to talk about. The AI program itself. Firstly, the AI's canon name. In Ace Combat 3, when starting up a new save file, you can erase the pre-written name and type in a new one. However, the name that's already typed in is important, because not only is that the AI program's canon name, the name itself is Nemo, Latin for no one. The player isn't a human, but rather an AI. Not someone, but rather, something. The second hint is in the ending to the new Com Ouroboros route. After shooting down Rena in the Night Raven, Nemo and Cynthia are both directed by Simon to return to new Com. By the sound of it, both of them have been forgiven for initially joining Ouroboros. Once it's just Nemo and Cynthia again, Cynthia tells Nemo this. <laughs> Ne. 
聞こえてないの Notice how Nemo doesn't reply. Cynthia asks Nemo if it can hear her after not hearing an answer. This is a hint as to how Nemo is programmed. Nemo was programmed to only ever take orders, not to give them. So, when Cynthia tells Nemo to pick a destination for them, be it heading back to Newcom or flying to somewhere else, Nemo doesn't respond because it literally can't. Nemo is incapable of giving orders by design. The third hint is towards the end of the general resource Ouroboros route, where Nemo suddenly becomes Dissienz' enemy out of the blue for seemingly no reason. That is Simon's programming kicking in, enforcing that no matter what, Dissienz has to be deleted from the electrosphere. The fourth and last hint I want to take a look at is the last mission of the general resource Ouroboros route, where you go to the electrosphere to finish off Dissienz. The electrosphere can only be accessed by sublimated copies of humans or other non human programs. Programs and pieces of AI. After all, the electrosphere is described as a network, and I would imagine there would be plenty of non human programs and other things in the network to keep it running, just as how the network you are currently using to watch this video is run by non human programs. Nemo being an AI program, it makes sense why it is able to enter the electrosphere to finish off Dissian. A regular human couldn't do that since they can't enter the electrosphere as they're not a program, be it a sublimated human program or an AI program. Program. So, Nemo is without question an AI. But what makes Nemo interesting to look at is that there are also hints that show the AI is self aware and alive in some ways, even in the confines of the programming that Simon pieced together for it. The first hint that Nemo has hints of being more alive and self aware is when you're confronted with decisions in the game, both big and small. One could definitely argue that the different paths and smaller decisions within them are simply programmed paths and decisions created by Simon. Simon, but something about these paths and decisions feel human. After all, Nemo doesn't instantly decide whether to stay or join a new faction. Because the player takes those few seconds to decide, so too does Nemo. Nemo is calculating its options, weighing its decisions, wondering where it should go and what it should do next. Yeah, for repeat playthroughs where you're trying to get the different endings, those decisions are made a lot faster, but because of the existence of the instinctive first time playthrough where you're presented with these options to begin with at first, it shows the human emotion of weighing your options first before making a decision. This hints at the fact that the various paths that Simon programmed for Nemo, they're very generous. Generous as in Nemo may experience these human-like emotions without realizing those emotions are pre-programmed in. I would even go as far as to say that Nemo can be attached to its wingman. One example is in the general resource route in the mission stratosphere, where Nemo can decide whether to continue with the mission or to save Keith. If Nemo truly didn't have any sort of emotional attachment to Keith in some way, why would Nemo go out of its way and jeopardize the mission to save him? Another example is in the Yupio route, where you're ordered to shoot down Clarkson's lane in Scylla and Charybdis. Probably the third time I butcher that name, but hey. Even though it isn't told to you, you also have the option of shooting down the allied fighter accompanying Rena. This leads to your transfer to Newcom, but no official offer to Newcom is given before then. Dissian invites you to join General Resource and Ouroboros, and Cynthia invites you to Ouroboros if you go down the Newcom route, but joining Newcom itself is different. Commander Park doesn't state if you refuse to shoot down Clarkson's plane, off to Newcom you go. He just orders you to shoot down the plane with no mentioning of what happens if you don't. Nemo wouldn't know what would happen if it shot down the allied UPO fighter. Therefore, I would argue that Nemo reacted on its feelings for Fiona and Clarkson, and potentially even on its suddenly throwing the ideals and goals of UPO out the window upon the order from Park, which could hint that Nemo can form attachments to ideals and beliefs as well. Another thing to support the idea of Nemo being able to have ideals and beliefs is in the Ouroboros route. If it agrees with Dissian that sublimation is for the good of the world, then it has a reason to follow him. If it was just a strict by-the-books program, Nemo wouldn't even consider joining Ouroboros to begin with because it wouldn't be able to experience any sort of attachment. There may be more examples in the game to show that Nemo is more alive than most people may think at first, but those are the big examples that I felt were important to emphasize. And here we are. 
we made it to the end. Originally, this was just going to be a simple review, but after seeing just how much ambition and innovation was put into this game, how much of a leap forward in the series this was, I knew I had to go above and beyond what I was originally planning. Ace Combat 3 represents a huge leap forward for the Ace Combat series in many forms. It's in this game where lots of mainstay elements of the series were first born, such as the ability to hear both ally and enemy comps chatter, SP weapons, and a story that's more complex than just, hey, a coup d'etat is happening, we're hiring you to put an end to it. To give a few examples, even though Ace Combat 3 is one of the more divisive titles in terms of opinions, and even though it may not be my personal favorite in the franchise, I cannot deny that this game made a very big impact. Later Ace Combat titles would gradually fine-tune existing mechanics and introduce all new ones that would go on to become mainstays for the franchise or otherwise play a role in making that particular title stand out. But in terms of the foundation, the core identity, the roots of the franchise, the main thing this series revolves around, I believe it truly started here. As I stated way back in the beginning of this video, Air Combat and Ace Combat 2 were the titles that showed that Namco and the team making the Ace Combat series were building that foundation. Ace Combat 3, on the other hand, represents the Ace Combat series having a true, solid idea on what it wanted to be moving forward. All of the titles moving forward include gradually larger scale battles, having multiple allies with you, as well as an increased unit count in general on both sides. Later Ace Combat titles would also expand on the SP weapons concept, special weapons becoming a core part of the loadout for your plane in the series. Later Ace Combat titles also expanded on the communications chatter, expanding from being able to hear main characters from both sides to being able to hear main characters and miscellaneous characters from both sides. And those are just a few examples I'm giving for the sake of brevity for this video, as if this video has any brevity to begin with. Ace Combat 3 is not only a good game to me, but an important one. All long-running franchises have that one entry that establishes the core of what it wants to be for the future. For the Ace Combat series, to me at least, Ace Combat 3 Electrosphere is that game. So, this video has taken me far too long to finish. At first, I thought I was just under a year behind when I first expressed interest in making an Ace Combat 3 video. Turns out it's been a year and a half since I said I would like to make this video. <gasps> Since then, I did need time to legitimately research on how I would not only play but record this game, but after that research, I kinda just let Ace Combat 3 take a back seat because I was wondering what I would need to do to upgrade my hardware, and here I am only recently having realized I don't need any hardware upgrades. My laptop can run and record the game just fine. Which, on the note of this video being out super, super, super late, shout out to Daniel Pogreb for having the patience of a saint for this video. They were the first one to recommend this game to me to make a video on, and I said, yeah, I'll do it. And then Daniel Pogreb proceeded to hear me say, oh, it's on the back burner, I'll get to it soon, don't worry, for about a year and a half or so. Why isn't it possible? It's just not. Why not, you stupid bastard? At least as a silver lining of sorts, this taught me to be careful about accepting game review requests since I can't be reckless about those because otherwise I'll be making any viewers who want that video wait a super long time, and I don't want a repeat of this whole thing of me saying that I'll eventually get to it and then that wait is a year, a year and a half, however long. I really don't want that happening again. Either way though, once again, shout out to Daniel Pogreb for putting up with me and the wait for this video. Beyond finally getting this video out after it being so long since I said I would make it, I am just super proud of this video. I know I said that about everything great about Ace Combat 7, so I'm already on the trend of sounding like a broken record, but I truly am happy that I got my first true retrospective on this channel finished and published. Being able to do a true retrospective of Ace Combat 3 was really fun to do, and I would love to do more retrospectives if the opportunity presents itself for the future. Speaking of retrospectives, I also want to shout out Snickety Slice 
Voices video on Ace Combat 3, as that was the main source of inspiration for me for changing this video from a review to a retrospective of my own. And it was also the video that helped me out with the section on the themes and characters of Ace Combat 3's story. His video is among the other sources I have listed in the newly added research sources section in the description of this video. Originally, I was going to have a whole disclaimer before the video dived into the different factions and characters saying how if something I said echoes what Snickety Slice said, all credit goes to him. But then I realized that I could just add the research sources section because one, the flow of the video isn't interrupted that way, and two, I can make this section of the description a new mainstay for when I need to do more in-depth research for future reviews and essays. That being said, I know that not everyone looks at the description of a video, and for pretty obvious reasons, I don't want to be accused of plagiarism. So starting with this video moving forward, any sources I use for a review or essay video will also be credited in my outros as well as you have seen here. Given that, my outros from now on will be more of a credits-like kind of outro, where I'll be listing all the gameplay, music, other videos, and as I just stated, any research that I will have needed to do for a video. On the note of Snickety Slice's video though, if you haven't seen his video yet and you're interested in more Ace Combat 3 stuff, I strongly recommend you give it a watch. Also, also, one more thing, Daniel Pogreb took a win away from my Everything Great About Ace Combat 7 video for not mentioning the Ace Combat 3 references in the game, and I couldn't find a good spot in this video to make those mentions without disturbing the flow of it, so... It's time for me to redeem myself. Jaeger from Ace Combat 7 is the father of Eric. In the DLC for Ace Combat 7, Rage and Scream are mercenaries flying for GR Guardian Mercenaries, a PMC group belonging to General Resource. But wait, I'm going to go even further beyond. In Ace Combat 6, in missions 10 and 13, Rogno Fortress and Liberation of Grace Maria, you can see cargo ships with General Resource crates on them. General Resource also appears in Ace Combat Advance, I don't know where, I just read on the wiki that the company does indeed show up in the game. In Ace Combat X, I believe the XFA-33 Fenrir is a predecessor to the XFA-36A game. Do please correct me if I am wrong on that though. Aircraft like the Falcon and Foreigners have prototype coffins that are predecessors to the full coffin cockpits of Ace Combat 3, and in other games like with Ridge Racer, groups like Newcom show up as Easter egg logos. Ah! I get to add more than one win to my total as redemption. Add him up! Once again, I am super proud that I got this video out at long last, and I hope that the effort that I put into this video did show. With that being said, thank you all for watching. I hope you enjoyed. If you did, go ahead and leave a like, drop a comment, and if video game reviews and essays are a type of content you enjoy here on YouTube, hit that subscribe button, and be sure to hit the bell icon to receive all notifications for future uploads. Until next time, this is Thunderous Fulf, signing off.